photograph. Um, as you can see, these guys are sitting in their great coats and their kepis. Um, well, not their kepis, their forage caps. I believe that this picture was taken so early in their enlistment that they hadn't even gotten their uniforms wet, hence the, the risen visors or the risen uh, crown of the cap. There we go. He will write his letter. Dear Aunt Susan, I have not written you since I have left home and have enjoyed camp life for one month today. I thought that I would take this opportunity of doing so, so since it has been a blank day here with us. It has been raining nearly all day and is very wet and muddy. He will continue to say, we drill about seven hours a day and get up at five in the morning and cease around nine in the evening. Uh, but, it has but it has happened that I was appointed to office. I get clear off a good deal of guard duty, but have to take charge of the guard whenever it comes my turn. He continues by saying, but I came to the expectation of doing my duty as far as possible. We do not enjoy such, this is where the, the typical 19th century letter to his, to his dear aunt, because you know he doesn't want to say anything bad about the army life. He says, we do not enjoy nice Sabbaths as we did at home, but there's very little difference between the days here. Although we started a prayer meeting in our tent, we have a good meeting. We hold them four times a week and they are very well attended. But we can hear, uh, but we can hear them on each side of us some swearing and some playing cards and other kinds of wickedness that was ever thought of. Yesterday, we had a review, which was a very pretty sight, all dressed in uniform. Here, would, here was eight regiments together, about eight or 9,000 soldiers together, and it made a long string. It was inspected by chief officers and their staffs. Old Abe and his lady was there. We have a pretty good grub to live on, but it is not as such as we got at home. I would like to see my children and friends and get some pie and cake, but I do not wish to stay there. I think as you think he, if he stayed there too long, he would get homesick and probably not want to return. We can get these knickknacks here, but we have to pay four pieces for them. We buy some butter from Times and, and have to give nearly 32 cents a pound, and it is the shortening tub butter, but tastes very well. He will continue by saying, I must close now, for I'm getting tired of wishing I was gone at where I was gone before today, give my respect to all inquiring friends and receive a share for yourself. Write soon direct to Washington, D.C., Camp Casey, Meridian Hill, Company H, 7th New Jersey Regiment, uh, signed Joseph Burt. Uh, Burt will be 34 at the time. If I know this, I think you can see it on this, but he writes 22nd TH, not 22nd ND, 22nd TH. Uh, he also writes a lot of E's and double N's in his letters, so very old English style of writing, which was very difficult to, uh, to understand when I was uh, transcribing the letter. On November 22nd, the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th New Jersey are put under the command of Samuel Starr and unofficially become the 2nd New Jersey Brigade. December 3rd, 1861, the brigade is assigned to command of General Joe Hooker and ordered to join him along Lower Potomac. The regiment will arrive at Rum Point and go down the Chicken Chickanoxon Creek at the 1,200-acre Posey Plantation and made Camp Revere at Bud's Ferry directly across the river from a rebel battery at Cockpit Point. Cockpit Point today is now where Quantico um, Marine Corps base is. The regiment would build huts first for the officers, then the enlisted, of course, then a church and a horse stable. They would deal with typhoid, smallpox, and pneumonia, as well as drill and guard duty. It is at some point, probably early on, that these men receive a box from friends back home. Uh, this illustration comes from uh, Alfred Bellard's book, uh, what's it called, Gone for a Soldier. Uh, it's an incredible book and incredible illustrations. I, it's one of my, one of my favorites and, and go-to when, when I uh, want to read something about New Jersey. So they write this letter, Camp Revere, Lower Potomac, Maryland. It is through you, the undersigned members of Company H of the 7th Regiment, New Jersey Volunteers, would desire to express our thanks to our Cedarville and Sayers Neck friends for the favor and respect they have shown us in sharing with us the blessings which God has bestowed upon them by sending a box packed full, and it was not a small size, but one that took the strength of a number of us boys to convey to our quarters. The first thing asked of us, where is the hatchet? But there was not much time wasted in thinking where we could, where we could procure one. 
One says, go to the lieutenant's tent and borrow his. We wish our friends to know that this was not repeated, for legs appeared too willing to do their duty immediately. The hatchet was procured, and at once we made our way into the box. There we found a list of names of the kind donors, and after reading a few orders which we, would not, which we could not help but seeing upon removing the lid, we forthwith proceeded to execute them without further delay. We found within the box such things Uncle Sam does not provide for his men, such as sausages, chickens, cakes, bread and butter, etc. And last of all, we came to a turkey cooked nicely and ready for eating. Uh, this we agreed to give to our much esteemed captain, J.H. Willits, who, with us, desires to send his esteem and regard for all of our friends who have, seen, who have been so kind in remembering us. Although we are separated from, from each other under a very peculiar circumstances, yet we assure our friends we often think of them and wish them well, hoping God will bless them and keep them, and, at, and that we may, after this dark cloud which now is hanging over our beloved country is dispelled, and not until it is, be so happy as to join glad hands with them in our dear native state of New Jersey. We with our, uh, uh, yeah, <clears throat> and we with our friends hope and pray that this may soon come to pass. Signed, Albert Bateman, Joseph Burt, Benjamin Ogden, Elmer Ogden, Elmer Damont, Joseph Diver, and Lorenzo Painter. On April 5th, uh, yes, on April 5th, the 2nd New Jersey Brigade will be packed like sheep onto two steamers, the Aerosmith. Actually, you know, before I read this, uh, these two photographs were from a reenactment I partook in last year at, um, where is it? Uh, uh, Point Lookout in Maryland. It was a uh, famous prison, uh, Confederate prison. Uh, the box, which I was, uh, what friends of mine had built, we stuffed everything in that box that was in this letter. A turkey, uh, I think we even had a duck, cakes, bread, butter, sausages, all sorts of goodies. And these guys, like I said, when it said we took many men to carry it, it took four of us to pick it up and bring it in there. And let me tell you, the officers were right in behind us trying to find any sort of, any sort of contraband in there. Uh, so April 5th, the men of the 2nd New Jersey Brigade will be packed like sheep onto two steamers, the Aerosmith and the John Brook, Old River Side Wheelers. They will have an extremely unpleasant trip uh, to Fort Monroe and will arrive on the 8th of April. But due to overcrowding at the docks and weather conditions, the men will be stuck on the boats until the 15th. They spend an entire week on these boats. Once they, la once they land and regain their, their land legs, they march to Yorktown where they arrive on the 21st. The Confederate Army would withdraw. Yeah. The Confederate Army would withdraw from Yorktown on the 4th and set in motion the chase to Williamsburg. This letter comes from Edgar Wilkinson of the 6th New Jersey Volunteers to a letter to his sister Phoebe. It's right here. Um, again, another drawing from uh, Gone for a Soldier from, from uh, Alfred Bellard's book. He starts by saying, he writes this letter on May 4th, and he starts his letter by saying, it is Sunday, to us a day of rest and rejoicing. Today gives proof to the fact that the rebellion is played out. The rebels have been, prepare, have been preparing during the past week to evacuate their strongholds at Yorktown by throwing away or destroying a few shells they have deposited here. He will continue by saying, last night, they fired several shot and shell at our balloon very boisterously, as though the rebellious blood stirred and boiled to think that the Yankee professor should rise up and look at their army flying before the Army of the Potomac. That's high praises to George McClellan, might I add. This morning, they fired their last shell from the fortifications at 20 minutes past five o'clock, and at 20 minutes past seven, the stars and stripes were flying over the center of their works, and our advanced pickets and sharpshooters were running in every direction through the evacuated camp. He will continue by saying, the band struck up Dixie's Land, and it was the first music we had heard in, for two weeks. It was followed by three loud cheers. Soon the long roll was heard from some of the regiments. Our brigade had not given a single cheer. Tough Jerseyman there, huh? We have had our inspection and are sitting back and letting the rebels go their own road of destruction, the only road left for them. He will continue by saying the sutlers had nothing to sell since we have been here, so we fare slim on salt junk and hard crackers. But there must be a change soon for, soon for better or worse, I do expect. I think I have the right to expect it will be better. He continues by saying Yorktown will be noted as a rebel race course instead of a battlefield. 
either will crush the rebellion. Sounds kind of uh, naive there, don't you think? He closes by saying, enclosed, you will find the photographs of General Hooker commanding our division. He is a man worthy of his office, much loved by all his men under his command. The picture is a good one. I want you to take care of it for my sake. Orders have come for us to move. And at the end, there's this little poem. I don't know if he wrote it, or, but it was printed. Um, like I said, it was printed in this newspaper article, which was found in the Historical Society. It says, for right is right since God is God, and right must win the day. Or, yeah, and right the day must win. To doubt would be disloyal. To falter would be sin. Now, this next account will be the longest one of the evening, uh, but not terribly long. Uh, it comes from uh, a, a man by the name of Captain Edward Alexander Acton, whose face is unfortunately covered by the, uh, the screen there. But he, I'm almost entirely sure that he writes this because of a line which he writes here, which it will, you will then uh, have found in this letter. Uh, Acton's letters are all published in a book called Dear Molly, uh, which is, again, were all of the letters to his wife and uh, which I was able to find online and print out for free, which I think if anybody with a little savviness can do that. Um, so without further ado, Acton's account of the Battle of Williamsburg. Um, now, mind you, when, the, when, when New Yorktown is evacuated on May 4th, the New Jersey Brigade, the second New Jersey Brigade is one of the first units to pursue. General Frank Patterson was assigned to the command of the second New Jersey Brigade and General Hooker's division and was ordered to advance from Yorktown, which he did starting at two o'clock p.m. Sunday, May the 4th. The brigade marched until 11 o'clock that night over and through the most horrible roads, corduroy roads, with the timbers buried in mud or half afloat in marsh water, and then lay down in a swamp about one mile beyond an old brick church. It will continue with, General Smith was supposed to have passed our advance during the night and in the morning as we neared the rebel works, the troops seen in their front were believed to be our own. Our men were steadily informed otherwise by the fierce discharge of shot and shell into our ranks, full into our ranks as we moved along the Williamsburg Road. This was about 10 a.m. At about 10 a.m., the rain falling in torrents, the men being half-leg half deep in the mire and water. Skirmishers were thrown forward, but they were quickly driven back by the rapid fire of the enemy, who proved not more to be than 300 yards distant, with his line, for, with his line formed along a ditch some three Ooh, excuse me, some three feet in depth. Whooping and howling like demons incarnate, they rushed after our skirmishers in mass. The dense undergrowth prevented our troops from seeing them fairly until they approached within pistol shot of our lines. From 10 a.m. until 1 p.m., the fight continued unabated. Now they, now they would force our gallant Jersey boys back, and surely, surely would their valor hurl the rebels bleeding and shattered back to their ditches and bushes. There was no opportunity here for the bayonet, the ground being covered with thick interlacing bushes and fallen trees, or also known as slashing. It's uh, a lot of second growth forestry in this, in this area known as the Bloody Ravine, which is gonna make it very difficult for the men to fire, let alone to keep their two ranks in line. Colonel Von Leer of the 6th New Jersey and his adjutant Wilkes were killed and a number of his officers killed or wounded. Lieutenant Colonel Carmen of the 7th was struck by a ball in his, wrist, in his wrist, which shattered his arm and came out at the elbow. One company in this regiment went into battle with but 40 men. Of these, eight were killed and 17 wounded. General Frank Patterson's horse was shot from under him, but mounted another, and he rode up and down the front, cheering his men and heedless to the leaden tempest that flew around him. So he, the reason I was able to connect this to Atkin was that he writes to his wife, he writes the phrase, the iron tempest of the ever memorable 5th of May. And I just think that's really specific for him to write iron tempest in one and leaden tempest to the other. General Freeze's aide was slightly wounded. He managed, however, to get a horse, he get, managed, however, to get a word to General Hooker concerning their condition, which at this moment was very critical. 100 rounds of ammunition were expended and our men were doggedly striving to beat their foe. Normally soldiers went into battle with 40, maybe 60 rounds of ammunition. Uh, <clears throat> who had driven them almost to the road. The drenching rain had rusted the muskets to a large extent and men were pushing their cartridges down by driving their ramrods against trees. The men were exhausted, having nothing to eat 
save a cracker or two, which they carried in their pockets from Sunday at 2 p.m. He will continue by saying, yet these brave fellows heroically contested the field with an enemy superior in numbers and held them in check until about one o'clock when General Sickles brought his brigade into action and relieved the weary and battle-begrimmed New Jerseyans. Um, General Sickles wasn't at Williamsburg. He was still, at, I believe he was still at Fort Monroe, but for the fact that Sickles gets into Acton's account, I think is kind of interesting. Just goes to show you that the reputation that he had and, uh, you know, and as much as another guy, the more I read about Sickles, the more I kind of like him. I used to not like him, but now like Jim Hessler is a big uh, Sickles guy. I really, every time I read about or hear about Sickles, I, I like him more and more. Major Rerson, Ryerson, R Y E R, yeah, Ryerson of the 8th took command when Colonel Johnson was wounded, but fell quickly after, pierced by three balls. His body was found the next morning stripped of everything and his head crushed with the butt of a musket after death. Captain Brown was shot through the cheeks. Lieutenant C.K. Hall, son of, Reverend, uh, son of Reverend Dr. Hall of Trenton, had a bullet through his coat collar, making a narrow escape. Lieutenant Lelier was killed. Lieutenant Angle severely wounded. Lieutenants, yeah, Lieutenants Acton and Doherty wounded severely as well. Second Lieutenant of Captain Hopper's company was shot through the chest and cannot live. Colonel Starr of the 5th New Jersey was also slightly wounded. This is Lieutenant Declan Lelier. Details were made, detail, oh, no, not that one. Uh, many of the Jersey boys thought they had found the, quote, last ditch, which is the burden of the Southern traders and heart fires. It is believed that the rebels had 600 or 700 killed and three times the numbers wounded. Uh, mind you that the New Jersey Brigade is going to be outnumbered sometimes four to one during the Battle of Williamsburg. During Monday, they played the old game of friends, white flags and the stars and stripes upon our troops and succeeded in deceiving them several times. Once a large body called out, don't shoot, we're your friends, we're New Hampshire boys. And when under the lie they were permitted to approach us, they suddenly leveled their pieces and threw a murderous fire into our ranks. The officers and men without exception behaved admirably under the hottest fire. Many were found dead with bayonet, yeah, many were found dead with bayonet and bowie knife thrusts who had only been wounded in the arms or legs, showing that they were inhumanely murdered, that they inhumanely murdered our living but hopeless men. New Jersey will be proud of her sons in this battle. Men never stood more bravely to their work, and the conflict at Williamsburg proves that the Jersey Blues of our day are worthy descendants of the heroes who made her name soil, her name and soil sacred for all time in the dark hours of the revolution. So it just goes to show you that that. These Jerseymen were proud of their of their heritage and whatnot. So their first fight at Williamsburg was, was a true test to them. This next account is from a man by the name of John Enos, who was a sergeant at the time. Uh, he will actually be in Acton's company. I think Acton served in uh, company, at this time he was in company F of the 5th New Jersey. Enos is one of his sergeants. Enos will write this on May the 8th after the battle. He will write by saying, friend, I am safe and well after one of the fiercest battles of the war. We found out the rebels left Yorktown on Saturday, on Sunday morning, and about 11 o'clock we packed up and started after them. We marched all day and very near all night. We had about four hours rest when we shouldered our knapsacks again. We did not march more than five miles before we came within a quarter of a mile of the rebel batteries when, they, when we were ordered to halt. Shot and shell fell thick among us, killing and wounding a good many yeah, killing and wounding a good many. Colonel Starr rode in front of our lines and said, keep cool, boys, fire low. Just about this time, those rebel shells passed within six inches of Lieutenant Godfrey's and mine head. We were standing together. I tell you, the sensation was peculiar and stunning. But when the order forward march was given, we pitched right in. We, the fifth, were sent off to the right to support one of the batteries. While we were there, the rebels surrounded us. Then it was the crossfire came into us. Men on both sides, men on both sides of me. Yeah, men fell on both sides of me. The rebels took the battery from us and turned the guns upon us. I thought I would never live to see such a sight. Our lieutenant colonel soon found a place of retreat and for us in the woods, and there we halted. When I came to look for our company, Company F, I could find but five. 
Our captain and lieutenants got separated from us. Perhaps they were among the killed and wounded or prisoners. So I had to take temporary command of the five. And while we were waiting, Colonel Starr rode up on us, but did not get us. For the reason was this. Now, this is one of uh, the two accounts I have that um, Will Stiple, who just wrote the huge Kearney epic, uh, 50 years of research, his entire life work. Um, as much as I like Will, he doesn't have this account or, or the other one that I'll show later. The reason was this. General Kearney of the 1st New Jersey Brigade had just posted some artillery in the road to shell the rebels. And as soon as he saw us, he told us that he wanted us to guard that battery. We had the notion not to follow him because we did not know, to, did not know him. But then he shouted, I am a one-armed Jerseyman. I'll lead you. Come on. We could, no longer we could not longer hesitate, but went with him. We formed in front of the battery and stayed, about 15, and stayed there about 15 minutes when out rushed the rebels from the woods right on top of us. They tried to take our battery from us. I tell you, we had to fight like fury to keep them from taking it. There were only about 60 of us when they made the charge, but we whipped them. One captain shot through the body. He fell to my feet. He begged so hard for me to take him out of his way, which I did. Balls were flying thick around us. I expected to get shot at every moment, but as good luck have it, I escaped. We lost 150 killed, wounded, and missing in our regiment. If the reinforcements had been a little later, we would have had a bull run of it. There were only 15,000 of us against 70,000 rebels. I think those numbers are a little inflated. We, found from, we fought from 6 o'clock in the morning until dark. The reinforcements came, came, up, came up about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and were welcome, I assure you. They came, uh, yes, they came to our aid shortly, shortly after the retreat commenced. Uh, he's talking at this point, he's talking about the Excelsior Brigade, which is going to come up the 70th, the 71st, 72nd, and 73rd of uh, New York. Uh, yes, they came shortly after the retreat commenced. The rebel yes, they, they came to our aid shortly after the retreat commenced. The rebels flanked us three times during the day, but were driven back. When, when, new, when new men came, yeah, when they knew, oh my goodness. When new, when new orders came, uh, they were retreating. We pitched in right and left. Lieutenant Acton, Sergeant Frazier, William Birch, and Charles W. Hall were wounded. Birch in the head and so severe, it is thought he could not recover. Several others in our company received scratches, but too slight to report. Mostly all, mostly all had shots through our clothing. Goodbye, John Enos. Now you see, I posted the, the article that I just read from. These are found, all these articles that I'm reading from are found in the collection of the Lawrence Township Historical Society. They're literally pasted into 1840s ledger books, which I don't know why somebody would do that. I, did, I believed in the markings of the book, it was done in the 1980s. But this is these literally flipping through these, these breaking pages, I was able to find this. This next account comes from Albert Bateman, who was one of the men that received the box in, in Lower Potomac. Uh, he's also photographed here uh, in what I believe is the uniform of the Cumberland Grays, which is a, a pre-war militia unit out of Cumberland County. They wear these horrendous 1850s frock coats that sort of, that just have these like blue cuffs, gray coats, blue caps. Um, but these photographs and his personal items uh, <clears throat> are found in the Cumberland County Historical Society in Greenwich, New Jersey. Albert Bateman will write, Dear Parents, you have, he writes this again on May 8th. Dear parents, you have no doubt you have heard of the Battle of Williamsburg on Monday last. We had a stormy day and hard night. I shall have to hurry through my letter for it is nearly dark and I have no candles. I am alive with a slight wound on my head. It is doing well and it will heal in a few days if nothing happens. Elmer Ogden was killed. He was shot right between the two eyes and killed instantly. He was not killed until after I had left the battleground. Lorenzo Painter was slightly wounded in the left arm, nothing serious. I will have to stop. It is getting too dark. Excuse me for not putting a stamp on the letter. We have lost our knapsacks and all our contents. I will write a little more in the morning. Now the, the green, not the green 2nd New Jersey Brigade, but the men of the 2nd New Jersey Brigade were so new to the life of being a soldier that they had the ignorance to drop their packs where they believed that they would return to them later. Bateman will continue by writing, 
It appears that we had some chaps to fight who, that had fought. That, yeah, it appears we had the same chaps to fight that we had at Bull Run. They came up. Uh, they came up. They came. Ooh, they came up once with the stars and stripes, and once with the flag of truce. They played all kinds of cowardly games, and they made us fall back once or twice. And they cried out, "Another Bull Run!" But thank God it was not another Bull Run by any means. They came with a yell, once thinking they would scare us so that we could run. I guess they will find out that the Bull Run affair is about played out now. We cut them scandalously. I was on the battlefield the next morning and there appeared to be five bullets. There appeared to be five rebels killed to our one. They were scattered all around. What a different feeling it, I noticed our men had. When we would find, <clears throat> when, when they would find, when they would find, when they, excuse me, getting ahead of myself here. When they would come to one of our own soldiers, they would say, poor fellow, he died in a good cause. When they came across a rebel, they would say, there you are, you bastard, you son of a bitch. It serves you right. That is the difference. We have captured a great many. There the rebel wounded would come and not help himself. But he would, yes, but he would, yeah, but he would not let our men do anything for him. He had a revolver. He said that he, that he said, he said the first man that touched him, he would shoot. So our men had to do it right there on the spot. The rebels just cut our knapsacks all to pieces after they had got what they want, what they wished. And here we are, a great many of us without a blanket. No more at present. Write soon your son, Albert Bateman. Again, another excellent drawing from, uh, from, from Alfred Bellard's uh, book. This one just showing exactly how these men had to live for the remainder of, the, or from that day forward sleeping on the grounds and in their overcoats. Benjamin Ogden, one of the men in the very first picture, uh, will write to his brother, uh, his brother Charles, who was serving in the 17th Illinois at the time. Um, now, what would bring a good Jersey boy away from his home and up to Illinois? Anyone? Anyone? A girl. A girl would bring him to Illinois. He would write on May the 18th, 1862, Dear brother, I suppose you wish to hear something from me in reference to our battle. I shall have to be brief for this. A half sheet is all that I have. We lost our knapsacks and everything that we had on our backs, and money is of no use here yet, for there is nothing to buy. Only once in a while a sutler gets a barrel of crackers, which he sells at 25 cents per pound, and tobacco at a dollar a plug. I must speak of our contest, although it makes me feel sad every time I mention it for it renews the recollection that one of our number lies beneath the battleground. Oh, how we miss him. When the battle commenced, six of us Cedarville boys stood side by side in the front rank. At night, one lay dead on the field and two in the hospital wounded. Three came without a scratch, although I had three bullet holes through my overcoat cape. I did not know poor Elmer had fallen or that Lorenzo Painter or Albert Bateman were wounded until night. One don't, one don't notice much that takes, that takes place around him in such time as that. After the battle was over, I began to inquire where, where, yeah, inquire where our boys were, for I had not seen any of them except Joseph Burt. He told me that Elmer Ogden was killed, for he saw him fall, and that Albert Bateman was wounded before he had fired a gun, and Lorenzo Painter was also wounded slightly. Two of those men are shown right here, Elmer Ogden and, and Lorenzo Painter. We built a large fire and sat by it until morning when General Hooker, God bless him, sent men on horseback to fetch us something to eat as soon as possible. About 10 o'clock, they came with bag of, bags of crackers and salt beef slung across the horse's back and also some coffee. You can't begin to know the joy of us half-starving, of us half-starved soldiers, for I don't suppose you ever had the trial, and God grant you may never. I was so glad to get a piece of raw salt beef that I sat down and cried for joy. Perhaps you may think I was foolish, but even our major shed tears to see the men tear into the raw beef with a good relish. After eating all I wanted, I went to the field where we had spent the previous day. There I saw sad sights I shall never forget. Many of the wounded still lying on the field, uttering cries that would startle the stoutest of hearts. The captain said we would bury Elmer where he fell. Sergeant Stiles and myself dug the grave and buried him. 
This was hard to do. The rebels had taken everything out of his pockets, even the rings off of his fingers. The only thing left was a pair of gloves, which I sent to his mother. This is what this line I'm about to read to you is the, is the title of this presentation. And uh, every time I read it, I get a little fired up. General Hooker says we were whipped three times, but did not know it. He says, we are not soldiers, but bulldogs. We do not stay in one place long, but we keep closing up towards Richmond. The report is the rebels have made a stand towards Richmond and it is my duty to be in another contest. I am ready, but I have no wish to see any more battles. I could tell you much more if I had a sheet of paper, if I had the paper. We expect to move tomorrow morning. I still remain your brother, Benjamin F. Ogden. It's a pretty long letter for a half sheet of paper. Here's the other Kearney account that I would love to show Will Stiple one day. Uh, or, if he's, or if he ever watches this video, he can just, you know, anyway. Um, this comes again, this is from another newspaper that was found in the collection of the Lawrence Township Historical Society. Uh, this comes from, uh, I don't know which of the two Bridgeton newspapers uh, this would be printed in because whoever made, whoever made the scrapbook didn't bother to cite their source, sort of like Shelby Foote. Um, it reads, Private Joseph Lohr of Newport, Cumberland County, who died Wednesday the 21st at Hospital of Fortress Monroe, would, uh, from a wound received at the Battle of Williamsburg, fought from seven o'clock in the morning until two o'clock in the afternoon when he fell. Although badly wounded and faint, when General Kearney's division came up at three o'clock playing Yankee Doodle and marching directly into action on the double quick, he said that the effect was so inspiring he made several attempts to get up and follow them. He lay in the mud for it was raining heavily for the from the time he was disabled until the next day, receiving in the meantime, no attention whatsoever. The surgeons and their assistants did it all in their power to relieve the suffering for the wounded, but the, uh, but the number was so great on the field and the action so extended that many were not cared for soon enough to save their lives. It is more probable that Private Joseph, that, that Private Lore's death resulted from neglect in dressing the wound in time. Just previous to his death, he was asked by chaplain in attendance whether he felt prepared to die. He answered without hesitation, I do. And again, he said, quote, I believe I have faithfully done my duty for my country and I know and I, know I die in a good cause. Those are sustainably his words as reported by Mr. Laddow who was present on the occasion. Uh, Joseph Lohr will be buried in the Bateman Memorial Cemetery in Newport, New Jersey, where you can visit him today. Getting ahead of myself here. Uh, this next account by Charles J. Silver, uh, which I have. One of these, this, uh, nope, one of them. One of them up here is, is this Charles Silver account. Charles Silver, our young friend Charles J. Silver of Heislerville, Cumberland County, who was dangerously wounded on the 5th in the Battle of Williamsburg, has since died in the hospital. He belonged to Company A of the 7th New Jersey Regiment and fell helplessly in the beginning of the fight by a bullet, where he lay 36 hours before attendants could be tended to him. During the time he was robbed of watch and brutally kicked and bruised, by the most vile and ungenerous rebels. This is sad news, and we most cordially sympathize with the bereaved friends and family of the loss of such a valuable, of such a valuable young man. He was a young man who had a great many friends and was noted for his pure and upright life. Well may it be said that he, quote, fought, bled, and died for his country. Um, Lieutenant Henry J. Johnson of Carpenter's Landing, killed at the Battle of Williamsburg, was taken home on Monday last and was interred on Wednesday morning. He was a, he was a lieutenant in Captain J. Howard Willett's company. He was here in Bridgeton recruiting for a time and formed many acquaintances who regret to hear of his death. He was very gentlemanly in his manner, social in his intercourse, and with all strictly moral of, in all habits of his life. He was fallen at an early age by a traitor's hand. He was not quite 23. 
And then there's a little poem at the bottom. It says, breathe his name tenderly, slowly and sad. Fell he so gallantly fighting the foe, giving his life for a country that he loved. True to his trust has taken the young soldier pr proved. And then lastly on this set one, there is, uh, so the first letter that I wrote from, uh, or one of the first ones that I read was from, uh, um, yeah, one of the first ones was from Edgar Wilkinson, um, who wrote the, the account at Yorktown. There was a remaining piece of that account, which I saved for later. Mr. Editor, it is written by a member of the 6th New Jersey Company K. We read the following. Our company was very much exposed during the battle, having to, having to contend against an overwhelming force. We repulsed the enemy's forces, but they were reinforced and would come back at us, howling like Indians. We were in the field from 9 o'clock until 2, before we were relieved by a reinforcement of our men. The rebels advanced under false colors and feigned themselves friends until they fired at us. Yet, although they came so near that they were often jumping over one panel of fence with our men, uh, yeah, while our men were jumping over the next panel, and the limbs of the trees, even splinters of the rails, would be flying above our heads like mown grass. But two of our company were killed, James McCormick of Cedarville and Edgar Wilkinson of Deerfield. They were both my tent mates, Wilkinson was shot in the left breast and was fighting to the last, as was McCormick, who was shot through the head. Wilkinson was only 21 years old. Now for my final slide, I believe it's the final slide, second to last slide. Um, okay, so these show the casualty reports for the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th New Jersey. For three of these four regiments, Williamsburg will be the single worst day of the war. Worse than Chancellorsville, worse than Gettysburg, worse than the wilderness, worse than Spotsylvania. And all of those days are absolutely terrible. Williamsburg for the 2nd New Jersey Brigade will be the worst. So for the list of fates, yeah, we'll just stick here. For the list of face, fates of, of the people mentioned in tonight's presentation, I'll start with J, Captain J.H. Willits who had spent three years at West Point in his early life, failing out due to poor marks in math and English, sort of like me. He will be promoted to Lieutenant Colonel of the 12th New Jersey and serve with the war until, uh, serve with the rest of the war with the 12th. His burial is, is unclear. Elmer Daymont will be discharged February 11th, 1863 of disability at the hospital in Newark, New Jersey. His, life, his unknown life and burial. Joseph Diver will be promoted to Corporal of Company H December 1st, 1862, and sees every major fight of the 7th, is in and would muster out in October of 1864. James McCormick would be killed in action at Williamsburg, final burial unknown. So there's a lot of guys like McCormick who are, who are evacuated or their bodies are brought back to New Jersey and they're left at Cape May and they don't know where their final resting place is. Uh, Phoebe, Wilkin Phoebe Foster Wilkinson Perry, who the, that letter was written to, marries a man by the name of Hannibal Perry on July, in July of 1868 and moves to Friesburg in Salem County and will mother nine children. Passed in 1903 at the age of 56 and rests in the yard of the Emanuel Evangelical Lutheran Church. Lieutenant Colonel Ezra Carman will recover from his wounds and promoted to Colonel of the 13th New Jersey and he will fight at Antietam, Gettysburg, and take part in the march to the sea. He will serve on the board that created an Antietam National Battlefield, and later will be the superintendent of the Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Battlefield. Carmen will pass away in Washington, D.C. in 1909 and is buried in Arlington Cemetery. So these are the headstones for four of the five guys in this photograph, which if you want to come up later, there's little biographies of all the men. Captain James Brown, not the singer, but Captain James Brown, commanding 5th New Jersey Company K, is wounded on May 5th and recovers and is promoted to the major of the 15th New Jersey on July 21st, 1862, but would resign February 26th of 1863. Lieutenant Charles K. Hall, adjutant and staff of General Patterson, wounded May 5th, is promoted to the Lieutenant Colonel of the 14th New Jersey, August 25th, 1862. 
Lieutenant and then later Captain Edward Alexander Acton, who wrote that rather long account that I read, would be wounded in the head and the wrist on May 5th and would be killed August 29th, 1862, while dueling with two Confederate sharpshooters. His letters are published and, and available online. He is buried in the Friends Cemetery of Salem, New Jersey. Lieutenant uh, Declan Lalier, the man who I showed you the little photograph of, uh, Declan Lalier, 5th Company E, 5th New Jersey, uh, killed at Williamsburg. His body is buried in Riverview Cemetery. He is about 100 yards from George Brenton McClellan. Lieutenant Charles Doherty, wounded May 5th, promoted to first lieutenant on February 23rd, 1863, and is promoted to adjutant on September 10th of 63, but, then, but is discharged and musters out on October of 1864. John Enos will die of typhoid fever at Fairfax, Virginia, April 4th, 1863, and his burial is unknown. Sergeant Charles Frazier, discharged from disability at U.S. Army Hospital in Philadelphia, July 31st, 1862. William Birch dies May 18, 1862, from wounds, received, from wounds received at Williamsburg, buried at National Cemetery, Hampton, Virginia. Section F, row five, grave, grave 26, in case anybody really wants to go see him. Uh, Charles W. Hall, discharged from disability at Fort Schuler, New York Harbor, March 4, 1863. And Joseph Lohr will die of his wounds on May 21, 1862, at the age of 18. He was one of seven children, and he is buried in Bateman Memorial Cemetery, down Township, Cumberland County. Um, I know you guys are doing a lot to get your to get a sign there at Williamsburg, which I believe, which I feel is is awesome to do so. Um, I'm sure many of you know they just found a mass grave at Williamsburg. I believe it's all Union soldiers. Well, well, I don't know exactly who it is, but we'll see soon who and what they were or where they were from. Uh, which. This right here is where the New Jersey Brigade will fight. This is where General Kearney's division will come up, which, and then of course you've got over here where General Hancock's brigade will come and take the left flank, which in my opinion, Hancock could not have been superb if Kearney wasn't magnificent. And I will close with this. I don't know if I have any more slides. I don't. Yes, I do. Um, I'll close with this. Although it was written after the Battle of Fredericksburg, the uh, the emphasis of of the New Jersey men in this in this little passage I could not help uh, but but add. It follow it reads as follows: the name of New Jersey again in all mouths and her praise on all tongues for the splendid gallantry of her troops in the severe battle on the Rappahannock. Wherever work was to be done requiring cool persistent valor, there were New Jersey soldiers ready and able to do it. The long lists of killed and wounded of her noble sons tell the story better than aught else. It is a proud thing for New Jersey to reflect that she never had a regiment falter on the field. The blood of the Jersey blues has no pollution of cowardice in its strains. All honor and thanks to the New Jersey line. Uh, like I said, the second New Jersey brigade will go on to be, um, will have their probably their greatest day at Chancellorsville where the seventh captures three flags. They will be cannibalized at Gettysburg, and I believe to be the MVP of Sickles Line on the second day at Gettysburg. And they will fight severely at, again at Cold Harbor. Uh, Chancellor, not Chancellorsville, geez, I already said that one. Um, Spotsylvania, the Wilderness, Cold Harbor, they will all see actions there. And then they will, they will uh, a lot of them will muster out in, in 1864, and a lot of them will re enlist and go back into the uh, fifth or the seventh New Jersey, the sixth and the eighth. Kind of muster out and go home. 